The Word of God says whoever hates another person is a murderer. God not only judges our actions, but He also judges the intentions of our heart. And if you've ever so much as called somebody a fool or an idiot, Jesus said you're deserving the same punishment as someone who's actually committed physical murder. Are you an adulterer at heart? Now you might say, well, I've never done that. I'm married and I've never cheated on my spouse or, or I'm not married, so I can't be an adulterer. But yet Jesus said, whoever looks at another person to lust after them has already committed adultery with that person in their heart. Again, God not only judges our actions, but he judges the intentions of our heart as well. Have you ever stole any, stolen anything? It doesn't matter how long ago. The value doesn't matter. It doesn't even matter if you've stolen for food. There's a proverb that says that we may feel sorry for someone who has stolen something to feed themselves, but yet they will repay what they've stolen more than seven times. If you've ever stolen anything, no matter how small, God will see you as a thief. How about this one? Have you ever told a lie? And you might think certainly God's not going to judge for something as small as a lie. But consider this. If you lie to a small child, that child probably is not going to be able to punish you. If you're married and you lie to your spouse, you might end up sleeping on the couch. Go to work, lie to your boss, you're going to lose your job. Go to school, lie on an exam, you might get kicked out of school. Stand before a judge and lie to him. Stand before a judge and lie to him and you might find yourself in prison. The offense hasn't changed. What's changed is whom the offense is against. God is holy and righteous and just. And no matter how small your sin is in your mind, if you've sinned against God, you've sinned against a holy and righteous God. And your sin is as infinitely sinful as He is infinitely holy. And He will hold you accountable. Have you ever coveted anything? Have you ever wanted something that doesn't belong to you? Have you ever tried to keep up with the Joseph? Well, that's another form of idolatry because you haven't been satisfied with what God has given you in this life. And if you've done that, He will see you as a coveter. Now, you might hear those commandments and think, well, all right, I might be guilty of one or two, but I haven't done all those things. That won't help you when you stand before God. Word of God says, whoever tries to keep the whole law and yet stumbles in one point has become guilty of all of it. And the reason that is true is because God is holy. And because God is holy, because He is righteous and just, He will punish sin. And the punishment God has assigned for sin is eternity in hell. And it doesn't matter whether or not you believe it. What matters is whether or not it's true. You can stand before a judge in a courtroom and say, I don't believe I'm guilty. I don't believe you're a judge and I don't believe I'm going to prison. And you start walking toward the door. How close are you going to get before the bailiff tackles you and carts you off to prison? It doesn't matter what you think of the judge. What matters is what the judge thinks of you. And folks, if you die in your sin, if you die and you stand before God and He finds you guilty, because He is good, He will punish that sin, and that punishment again is eternity in hell. I don't want to see that for anybody. I don't want to see anybody spend eternity in hell. And there's only one way you can escape God's holy and just wrath, and that is through the precious gift of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man, God the Father sent His Son to earth in the person of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin, just as the prophet said He would be 750 years before His birth. And about 30 to 33 years into that earthly existence, He voluntarily went to the cross. He suffered and died a horrible death He did not deserve to take upon Himself the punishment you and I rightly deserve for violating God's law. And then three days later, He rose from the dead. No, what God requires of you is that you repent that you turn away from your sin, that you forsake your sin, and by faith and by faith alone, receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Jesus Christ, fully God and fully man. Jesus Christ, who performed miracles like turning water into wine, making the blind see, raising the dead. Jesus Christ, who walked on water. Jesus Christ, who knew the hearts of men, who knew their thoughts before they thought them. Jesus Christ, the only one who was able to conquer sin and death through His sacrifice on the cross. Jesus Christ, the only one who has raised Himself from the dead. Jesus Christ, the only God. Every other God is false. He is the only God who can save you. Buddha cannot save you. Buddha is dead. Mohammed can't save you. Mohammed is dead. The millions of false gods created out of wood and stone by those who worship the Hindu gods, millions of them, 
they're all figments of their imagination. Think about it. A great exchange took place on that cross when Jesus Christ shed his innocent blood and died that horrible death on that cross. God made him who knew no sin become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. An amazing exchange took place. God poured out his wrath upon his son. God literally placed all the sin of those who repent and believe upon his son. And those who repent and believe, instead of standing before God and being clothed only in the filthy garments of their sin, they will be clothed in the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you die in that state of righteousness, not your righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ, instead of receiving what you deserve for violating God's law, which is eternity in hell, you'll receive what you don't deserve and what I don't deserve, which is grace and peace and mercy and love and everlasting life with Jesus Christ the Lord. Hear what I'm saying to you. Come on up. Why, do, why does the gift of salvation and eternal life and forgiveness of your sin sound like a hateful? Fairy tale? What, what makes you think it's a fairy tale, sir? What makes you think it's a fairy tale? What are you afraid of, sir? Oh, he's on a public street. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. What do you? Why do you think it's a fairy tale? Because you got a what evidence? What evidence do you have? All right. What's your first name, sir? What's your first name? I'm sorry. Roberto. 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 Tony. Nice to meet you. If you want to go to the Mac, I won't film you. I'll make. All right, Roberto. Can I ask you a question? Let me post something to you, okay? And see what you think. It'll just take a couple minutes. All right? Because because there is evidence for what I'm telling you. It's true. It's in that book. Yes, it is in this book. Have you ever believed anything you've read? Uh, yeah. Why did you believe it, Roberto? It's called scientific evidence. What? Give me an example, Roberto. Of scientific? Give me a, an example of something you believed because you read it. Can't think of anything? The reason I believe this book is because it's the inspired Holy Word of God. It's proven itself historically it has proven itself archaeologically. It has proven itself prophetically, unlike any other holy book ever written by men. More than 300 prophecies were perfectly fulfilled by Jesus Christ. No other, no other person, no other God, no other holy book can, can claim that fact. And that is verifiable. That is provable. I don't want to get an argument with you. I just think that, that you were like threatening people with hell and all this like crazy stuff. And there's a difference between and you were talking crap about like Muhammad Roberto, and Buddha. Roberto, there's a difference. Well, what I said about Muhammad and Buddha is true. They're both dead. Right. They're as, dead. As is Jesus. No, he's not. He's totally dead. No, he's not. Let me prove it to you. Let so, me prove it to you. I mean, you know, like you're Roberto, basically if, putting down over Roberto, if LAPD rolled up here, threw handcuffs on you, threw you in the back seat of the car because they believed you robbed the coffee shop down the street. Right, we all see you standing here. We know you didn't do that. You're standing here having this conversation with this guy on the box. But yet, you, they believe you match the description of the guy who robbed that store. Okay. They, they present the case to the DA and say, yeah, we think we have enough evidence. We're going to go to trial against Roberto. So you go out and get yourself a good attorney. Your attorney rounds up the 100 plus people here and finds others, up to 500, who are able to say, there is no way Roberto robbed that coffee shop because he was here at the NoHo Metro Station. The trial takes weeks. One after another, they testify to your innocence. The trial goes to the jury. The jury deliberates for all of 30 minutes, and they come back with a guilty verdict against you. Would that be just? No, that wouldn't be just. You've been convicted of a crime you didn't commit. If you were in the jury, Roberto, and you heard 500 eyewitnesses, maybe some of them knew the person accused, most of them maybe didn't, but they all testified to that person's innocence. Would that be enough evidence for you as a juror to exonerate that person of a crime they did not commit? Sounds about right. All right. Let's see how much integrity you have in that line of thought. Because no less than 500 eyewitnesses testified, many of them willing to go to their death, that Jesus Christ did not remain in the tomb, that he rose from the grave. They weren't just believing a legend. They weren't just believing a wives' tale or a fairy tale. They saw him. They walked with him. They broke bread with him. They touched him. Thomas, one of the remaining 11 disciples, he was told by the other 10, 
that they had seen the risen Lord, that he was alive. And he said, unless I put my finger in his hands and my finger in his side, I will not believe. And Jesus appears to him. And what does, what does Thomas do? Does he, does he rub his stomach and rub his head and say, well, I, I must have had too much mustard on my unleavened bread. I'm seeing things. No, he dropped to his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. There's plenty of evidence, Roberto. But you probably, like so many other people here, you just are so much in love with your sin that you won't believe the truth. And I can't convince you of that because only God can change your heart. And that's what I hope he does. And I'm not threatening anybody because I can't send anybody to hell, Roberto. I can't send anybody there. What I'm doing is I'm warning people like you of what there is to come if you don't turn from your sin and by faith alone receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior.